Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you'd care to. We would love to have you. We're going to pick it up today. Psalm 107, verse 25. Uh, Psalm 107, the delivering and healing living Word. And it's a very important uh, psalm. And, and those of you who uh, have the Word of God written on your heart and written in your mind, you know how, how good the Word makes you feel, how healing it is. And I'll tell you, you know, try it. If you're ever ha having a bad day and things, nothing's going right, uh, take a minute and sit down with God's Word and just read a few, a few verses even and you find this peace that comes over you. I do. I always feel better uh, when things are not going well if I pick up the Word. It's calming. It's healing. Uh, his living Word is that. And don't forget His Word is alive. And all of our blessings are bound up in living on the Word of God. That's, that's where true knowledge comes from. Uh, that's where blessings definitely come from. We talked in our last lecture about those who uh, were in the wilderness, the, the 40 years, the younger generation, that eventually God did deliver them into the promised land. And then we talked about fools uh, that rebel against God and how God, even if they turn, even fools and those who are rebellious children, if they turn with their heart to Him and return to Him, he will deliver and heal them as well. And as we ended our last lecture, we'd just taken up those who go down to the sea in ships and do business in the great waters. In other words, those who, who uh, go by the, the ships of Tarshish, as they're called in the Old Testament, and, and, and travel around the world uh, obtaining, uh, in the case sometimes, Ophir, they went to, which was the finest gold in the world, and uh, merchants, in other words, who do business uh, by the seas. But we learn, too, then, that th these see the works of the Lord, those who go down to the sea in ships. Uh, you know, they may cuss like sailors, but you better believe they're believers because they've seen the awesome power of God. Can you imagine being out in the ocean and and seeing a hurricane uh, uh, or being involved in rough waters where the swells go straight up 30 or 35 feet. And then once you top that, it's straight down 30 or 35 feet. Uh, anyone who's served in the Navy on a ship uh, can attest to how uh, rough of a ride that can be. That's where we pick it up today. Let's ask that uh, word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name, Father. We ask you to Open eyes, open ears this day. Let's pick it up. Psalm 107, uh, verse 25. For he, this being our heavenly Father, commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. He's totally uh, in control. And he can uh, cause, and I want you to think of an analogy of, of being out on the, the oceans in a ship with your journey through life. And uh, you can have smooth sailing if you do things God's way, or you can have rough waters, rough seas. Verse 26, they, referring to the waves, mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. The seagoing merchants' uh, souls are melted uh, because of trouble. They, they see and understand the awesome power of God. And just as, as God delivers and healed the generation, the younger members of that generation who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, 
and, and, and delivered and healed the fools, God also delivers uh, the seagoing merchants uh, from trouble when they call out to him. Verse 27, they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Many of you with reference Bibles, you have a, a note on this and in the Hebrew, the phrase are at their wit's end in the Hebrew is all their wisdom is swallowed up. In other words, uh, it's swallowed up within itself. 28, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, uh, calling out to him in a time of trouble. And he bringeth them out of their distresses, just as God delivered the wanderers in the wilderness and the fools who return and repent to him and the seagoing merchants, he'll deliver you as well if you turn to him. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. And I couldn't help but think about when Jesus was in, in Mark chapter four, uh, verse 39, you can read about Jesus said to his disciples, uh, they were getting ready to board a ship and he said, let's go over to the other side. Uh, and there wasn't any question that we were going over to the other side. But then Jesus went to, to get some rest and he, he slept in the hinder part of the ship and a terrible storm came up and they were taking water on. That's how bad it was getting. And uh, the disciples went to Jesus and they said, Master, care not thou that we, that we perish? And Jesus went to the deck of the ship and he said, peace be still. And the waters were calm. And you know, he can do the same thing for you in your life. If, if, if you're sailing through troubled waters and you turn to him with a repentant heart, he can say, peace be still. And I'm talking about a, a peace of mind that, that only comes from having a relationship with your heavenly Father. You know, he's the same yesterday, today, and he will be tomorrow. Your relationship with your heavenly Father depends on you and you alone. So how you doing, friend? Uh, have you got smooth sailing in your life? Or does it seem like there's troubled waters at every turn? That there's always a problem uh, coming up that causes you to, to be angry or anxious uh, think about it, and, and, and like I said, he can, if you turn to him and ask for that deliverance and that healing, he'll say, peace be still, and the, the sailing will become much smoother in your life. Verse 30, then are they glad because they be quiet. The, the seagoing merchants are happy when the seas become quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. He guides them uh, into their desired port. And you know, we all have a, a port uh, in, our, in our future. It's one that I hope you know about. It's called the eternity, the kingdom of God, if you will. And, and if you follow his instructions, he will deliver, he'll heal you with that living word and he will guide you into that desired port. Don't ever forget to thank God uh, when he does deliver you. Verse 31, and that's what the psalmist reminds us of in verse 31. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, exclamation point. That's the fourth time that verse has been repeated in this one psalm, Psalm 107. Uh, the psalmist is making a point, and I hope you'll take it to heart, and that is don't let the only time that your father hears from you be when you're in times of trouble. You know, and think about it, God has emotions just like we do. We, we were created in his image, so he has emotions like we do. But think if you had a child, well, let's say you have two children, and one of them, the only time you hear from, uh, the, the, say it's a son, the only time you hear from him is when he's flat busted 
and he needs to borrow some money. Do any of you have family members like that? I'm sure most of you do. But, and then you have another son who you did help out on one occasion, and, and on your birthday he remembers to send you a card, or he picks up the phone and calls and says, thank you for helping me out of that jam I was in last year. Your father's the same way, your heavenly father. Don't forget to praise him. That means to thank him. Uh, don't let it be that the only time you go to him is in times of trouble. Nothing wrong with going to him in times of trouble. Uh, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying don't let that be the only time that your heavenly father hears from you. Worship him and declare his works and he will deliver you as well. 32. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. And that's what we should do when we gather together in his name, to exalt his name, exalt and praise him. 33. He, this is our Father, turneth rivers into wilderness. A wilderness is a desert and the water springs uh, for the source of water into dry ground. God controls uh, nature. And uh, this is saying that if, if you are in a fertile area where there's plenty of water, he can make it dry if he chooses to. And why would he choose to make it dry? Because of what the people in the land are doing or not doing. And in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, we have the blessing and the curses of God. And some might say, you, did you say curses of God? Well, you're not familiar with Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 if you don't believe that God curses. Because it states there in, in Leviticus 26, God says, if you do things my way, I will cause rain in due season, the, the former and the latter rain, and, and, and I, you will have plenty to eat. Uh, you'll throw food out of your barns to make room for the new produce as it's coming in. But then he goes on to say, if you walk contrary to me, I'll walk contrary to you, and I'll make your heaven as brass and your, your, your ground as iron. Have you ever tried to plow uh, a ground that's as hard as iron? You can't break it up. You, you can't get a seed in the ground, so you're sure not going to get any produce uh, as a result. Again, though, what God does, it's his land to do with as he chooses. What makes him decide what he's going to do with his land is the behavior of his children in the land. 34, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. You forget God and, and all they can think about is when things are going well, they say, look what I did with my hands. They don't give God the credit. And what this is saying is just like he can take uh, land that has plenty of water, a river even, in verse 33, and turn it into a desert, he can also take a fruitful land and he can turn it into barrenness. Check out that word barrenness. It means saltness. You can't grow anything in salt. Think of the great salt flats. For the wickedness of them that dwell therein, again, we see that what God does with the land depends on the behavior of those in the land. And then on the other hand, in contrast, verse 35, he, referring to our Father, turneth the wilderness, or the desert, into a standing water, and dry ground into water springs. And in other words, he can make uh, the desert fertile by bringing water to it. And don't forget to look at the spiritual aspect of this as well, because it's the living water that, that we depend on for our spiritual thirst. Uh, the living word, the bread of life, is what we depend on for our spiritual food. So uh, he can provide plenty for you, 
or if you want to walk contrary to him, he'll walk contrary to you. And as is written in Amos chapter 8, verse 11, the famine of the end time is not for bread or water. It is for hearing the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the famine is on. Verse 36, And there he maketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city for habitation. And this is talking about those uh, back in verse 9 that were hungry, their soul was hungry. Uh, and God filleth the hungry soul with goodness. Think spiritual again. But here uh, he's taking those who are hungry for his word and, and return to him and partake of his word that he will deliver and heal them. And he will deliver them into a safe city for habitation. In other words, those who are humble and grateful receive his blessings. Remember, all blessings are caught up in living on the words of God. 37. And sow the fields and plant vineyards, which may yield fruits of increases. Blessings all come from our Heavenly Father. And note this, though, that, that he expects his children to work, to sow the fields and to plant vineyards. And and if you're not uh, raised in a rural area, this not, doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that, that you can't include yourself in this. Whatever you do for a living, God expects his children to work, uh, those who are able. And, and he doesn't like lazy people. He likens lazy people in the book of Proverbs uh, to someone who is like uh, hinged to their bed. All they can do is flop from one side of the bed to the other like they were hinged to it. God expects his children who are able to work and to produce fruit. 38, he blesseth them also so that they are multiplied greatly and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. And the first phrase here, the blessed them, is talking about the people, the inhabitants of the land. And, and he makes sure that they are not barren, that, that they are able to not only produce children, but also to produce uh, food that they need to exist. Uh, the, he makes them successful. And to multiply someone greatly doesn't necessarily uh, mean just children only, is my point. To multiply somebody greatly is to multiply their success, their wealth, if you will. And on the other hand, he doesn't allow their cattle to decrease in, in number. And, and if you're, if you're a, a rancher and your livelihood is your cattle, uh, the more calves that are, are produced by your herds, the more profitable your business is. And, and that's just the way it is. And, you know, we can apply that not only to, as I said a minute ago, to rural areas, but, you know, many times people are, start a business and, and they're successful. Things are going well. But then all of a sudden, if you leave God out of the equation, uh, things start going badly. They start going south. Uh, your business might start losing money. And you start wondering, you know, what's going, what's different here? I, I have the same employees, I have the same business plan, but all of a sudden we're losing money. Uh, consider your ways. All blessings are depend on living uh, the word of God. They're bound up with living on the words of God. Don't leave God out of the equation. Don't take credit for your success uh, yourself. Uh, Israel, at one point in time, in, in the Song of Moses, uh, God has a pet name for them called Jeshurun. And it's when Israel became uh, successful. But when they became successful, they forgot about God. Uh, they were fat, dumb, and sassy. And they forgot the, even the rock of God's salvation and started making up new gods who their fathers didn't know. Uh, don't be like Jeshurun, I can assure you. Uh, the blessings are not going to be there. 
39, <clears throat> again, they were minished, or this means they uh, became few, and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. And I think this, uh, some bring affliction on themselves. They're called fools, as we read in verse 17. I think this more, though, is talking about the righteous who try and do things God's way, when, do they, they become oppressed and afflicted at the hands of the wicked. But the wicked get what's coming to them, as we learn in the last verses of this uh, Psalm 107, verse 40. He poureth contempt upon princes, upon the tyrants who bring oppression and affliction on his children who love and serve him. He said, touch not mine anointed, and he means it and causeth them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. This word wilderness in the Hebrew, a word that many of you are familiar with, it's tuhu. And you learn the word in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, where we learn that the world uh, became tuhu, which means void. And that's what this means here. They, they, the, he causeth them, God causes the princes or the tyrants that brought oppression and affliction on those who love and serve him to find a, a void place where there is no way. 41, yet setteth he the poor, or the humble, on high from affliction and maketh him families like a flock. In other words, make their families of great number and with the flock, I can't always help but think about uh, the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. The righteous shall see it and rejoice. That is a time to rejoice when the wicked get what they have coming to them. And all iniquity shall stop her mouth. The tyrants will have nothing more to boast about uh, when God shuts their mouth. And I couldn't help but think about uh, Satan. Uh, he's the biggest tyrant of all. And, you know, there comes a time when his mouth is going to be shut. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, when he goes into that lake of fire. Uh, his mouth will be shut. We will never hear anything of him uh, forever and ever. I look forward to that day. Verse 43, to complete Psalm 107. Whoso is wise, now this isn't for fools, this is for those who are wise and will observe these things. That's this word observe, shamar, it means to, to hedge about or, or take guard of these things. Even they shall understand or discern the loving kindness of the Lord and understand that the wicked do not get ahead. Uh, they end up right alongside Satan in the lake of fire. But what a beautiful psalm this is. And, and, and a couple of things I want to recap. Uh, the, don't ever forget verse 20 in Psalm 107. He, referring to our Heavenly Father, sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. And God's Word will deliver you and heal you as well. You know, we receive hundreds of letters every day, thousands over the course of a week. And, and in many of those letters, it's a witness of that fact that, that God sent His Word to deliver and to heal. We receive letters from people who were hung up, uh, hung out on drugs. They'd lost their homes. They'd lost their families. But then they found God's Word, and God's Word delivered them, and God's Word healed them. God's Word changes lives, beloved. And if things are not going well for you, I encourage you to consider your ways. Get into your Father's Word. You know, He loves you. He may or may not love what you're doing at this time, but uh, that's not to prevent you from getting back into His Word. Receive His deliverance and receive His healing. Psalm 108 through 110 relate to 
the true David, and by that I mean the second man David, Jesus Christ, in that he descended from the first man David. But the true David, Jesus, in deliverance and triumph. Uh, and, and it is a song, which is sheer in the Hebrew, to be sung, or psalm, mizmor, a meditation of David, uh, one of the 15 psalms in the Deuteronomy book that are attributed to David. In Psalm 109, we see also uh, the humiliation or the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross. In Psalm 110, a psalm that many of you are probably very familiar with, we see the exaltation of the true David, that meaning Jesus Christ. Psalm 108, verse 1, and it reads, O God, my heart, or my mind, you can translate this, is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. And this doesn't mean David is glorifying himself. This means that for his heart or his tongue, which give glory to the Father. And I like this, my mind is fixed. And you know, David certainly wasn't uh, perfect. He, he made mistakes. And all of us make mistakes. We all fall short, so let's not be too quick to judge David. Uh, and one thing that David never did, though, was he never fell away into idolatry. Uh, his own son Solomon did, and many of his descendants who ascended to the throne of Judah fell into idolatry. But David never fell that far away from the Father. He was, his mind was fixed, which means his mind was steadfast uh, with the Lord. He wasn't like a reed uh, blowing in the wind, uh, just one direction, the wind blowing, and then the other. Verse 2, Awake, sultry, and harp, I myself will awake early. In other words, I'll awake the dawn with my song and praise of Yahweh, with praises of the Lord. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people, and I will sing praises <clears throat> unto thee among the nations. It's not going to be a whisper. It's going to be loud enough that all in the world can hear my song of praise. And you know what? This ministry uh, doesn't whisper uh, the songs and praise of the Lord either. This show goes into millions of homes at this time, and, and it's not a whisper. Uh, we are shouting the praise of the Lord. Many people are hearing. I like this. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. It's important for you to witness to other people what God has done for you. And, and you know what? It might help them, and then God will help them. You don't uh, light a candle and then put it under a bushel basket or under the bed, as Jesus would teach in the New Testament. Verse 4, For thy mercy is great above the heavens, and thy truth reacheth unto the clouds, or into the heavens, in other words. And you know, his, his mercy is, is the unmerited favor that he bestows upon us. And when I say unmerited, I mean that really none of us deserves it. But uh, if we're trying, he is always there to give us more favor than what we deserve. Verse 5, Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and thy glory above all the earth. In other words, manifest yourself, Father, to where even the wicked uh, know that you are the God of all. Verse 6, that thy beloved, and this is actually in the Hebrew is plural, uh, in other words, that thy beloved ones may be delivered, save with thy right hand and answer me. And the right hand always uh, symbolic of power. And when we get to Psalm 110, we see also who is at the right hand of God. Now, verses 7 through 13, uh, we're going to see David claiming 
the promise that the land of Canaan uh, would become uh, the land of Israel. David also claiming the promises of Numbers chapter 24 verse 18 and the following verses as we I'll explain more as we work our way through this chapter. This psalm better said. Verse 7, God hath spoken in his holiness, or he has sworn by his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide or apportion Shechem and meet out or measure out the valley of Sukkoth. Uh, this is on the west and the east side of Jordan. And David's going to take us on a little geographical tour uh, of Israel as he claims the promises of God concerning the land of Canaan uh, becoming the land of Israel. And we're also going to see some enemies of God defeated, uh, your enemies as well. Verse 8, Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, both on the eastern side of Jordan, or at least half the tribe of Manasseh was. Ephraim also on the west side of Jordan now. Also is the strength of mine head. Judah is my law giver. Ephraim, uh, the, the larger of the ten tribes to the north, also known as ferocious warriors. And this head you could also translate uh, mine helmet uh, in other words, my staff of command, if you will. Judah, on the other hand, uh, the blessings of Jacob on his son Judah is listed in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, was that the scepter, in other words, the king line, would always be uh, through Judah, and also that there would always be a law giver. Verse 9, Moab is my wash pot. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. Over Philistia will I triumph. Now, um, a washpot, that's a very derogatory statement. It means I'm going to make Moab my foot bath. I'm going to wash my feet on Moab, in other words. And when you cast out your shoe, uh, that was symbolic of taking possession of a land. Uh, to take your shoe off in your own land was to surrender your land. Verse 10, who will bring me into the strong city? Question, who will lead me into Edom? The strong city here probably in reference to uh, Sela or Petra, uh, the rock corresponding with Edom in other words. And, and again, I mentioned Numbers chapter 24 verse 16 and then following through verse 22. And we have there the prophecy of the fall of Edom, which is Rush. Uh, we also have there the, the, uh, the, the defeat of the Moabites prophesied. Also the Kenites prophesied. We'll come back and spend a little more time on that in our next lecture. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldea, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. 
Uh, please keep your questions of a biblical nature and don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. Uh, we teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. And if you're listening by shortwave radio or the internet somewhere around the world that can't use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in as well. Let me also uh, mention once again, don't ask for a written response to your questions. Right here on the air is the only format for answering questions. We simply don't have uh, the time or staff to give a written response to everyone who would like one. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the 800 telephone number. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. I encourage you to go to Him, and as we discussed in our lesson today, don't let the only time that He hears from you be when you're in time of trouble. Uh, go, make a few minutes each day to tell your Father that you love Him and to thank Him for the many blessings that He bestows upon us. We take a lot for granted from Him. And we got these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look on these, Father. You know their needs, illnesses in family. We ask you to touch and heal if it is your will. And also we have people, Father, who are strung out on drugs and alcohol, Father. You know their needs if it is your will. A special blessing on each of them, Father. Uh, we know that your word is capable of delivering and healing. We ask that, uh, that, you, that you touch their hearts, give them the unction to find your word, Father. We know that it changes lives. Uh, we do have these prayers, and again, we come united in the name of Jesus. We ask you to touch, watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen, and thank you, Father. And uh, yesterday, in our last lecture, we talked about the Apocrypha, uh, whether or not that the chapter 7 of 2 Esdras, uh, verse 77 in the following verses, where that is at and where it's not at. And uh, I had mentioned that someone asked me at church last Sunday about the King James 1611 Bible, which does contain the Apocrypha, but it's a different set of manuscripts in the 1611 Bible than what the Goodspeed translation uses. You see the bracketed verses in 2 Ezra chapter 7, which includes verse 77, the one that I've been mentioning is where it talks about the bad side of the gulf as we find in Luke chapter 16. But the bracketed verses, and there are several, uh, uh, mark the missing portion uh, that was discovered by Binsley at Amiens and was first published in 1875. Uh, by the way, too, uh, for years we have held the price or uh, the donation that we ask for a copy of the Apocrypha uh, at $15. The printing costs, the paper costs, everything, as you know, uh, gone up up, up, and we finally had to succumb and, and give in, and the uh, Apocrypha will soon be published in the list we're distributing uh, with the upcoming newsletter. The Apocrypha, we're going to have to raise it to $20, but it's still a, a, a wonderful work, uh, one that if you're a student of God's Word, you need to have a copy. If you get one elsewhere, make sure it is a good speed uh, translation of the Apocrypha. Uh, Pete in Maine, where in the Bible does it say that the conception of Jesus was in December and his birth was in September? And in Luke chapter 1, if you understand the course of Abiah, we can determine the, the, what you just said, that Jesus was actually conceived on December 25th uh, he was born approximately September 29th. And by understanding the course of Abiah, which was established as the courses of the priest all the way back in the time of David and is recorded in the, uh, the Chronicles, First Chronicles. But the course of Abiah was a specific time that came around twice 
a year. There were 24 courses of the priest. They all served two times through the year on a rotating basis. And then all three, or all, all of the priests, I should say, uh, served at Jerusalem for the great ingatherings, the three major feasts, Passover, uh, the uh, Feast of Weeks, also known as Pentecost today, and the Feast of Tabernacles. But understanding that course of Abiah, we learn that Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, was serving the course of Abiah in Jerusalem, which nails down a time. And he was contacted and he was advised that uh, he and his wife were going to have a son. And you're to call him John. Uh, John, uh, you'll name him. That, of course, John was John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist, the first cousin of Jesus, was conceived exactly six months before Jesus Christ was conceived. So by understanding when John the Baptist was conceived, uh, or we can readily determine when Jesus was conceived. That was on uh, December 25th. We'll be airing a special uh, this month if you're watching the live program entitled Christmas. And that goes into that course of Abiah and many other uh, facts that uh, support the, the truth that Jesus was conceived on December 25th. Now, does that mean we shouldn't celebrate? No, quite to the contrary. I think that when the Word became flesh, that is really something to celebrate. And after all, that Word did become flesh uh, on December 25th at the conception. Glenna in Texas, all my life I've been taught the unforgivable sin is suicide. Is this right? No, suicide is not the unforgivable sin. Uh, does suicide anger our father? I would think so. I mean, you know, after all, someone who takes their life, what have they done? They've murdered one of God's children, and you know what God thinks about murder. But that does not mean that it's unforgivable. The unforgivable sin you'll find in Luke chapter 12, uh, verses 10 through 13, and that is for one of God's elect when they're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan to refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through them. Not possible that anyone has committed that sin at this point in time. And you follow with the second question, if you think a bad act but never actually do it, is it still against you. And I think that you may be thinking about Matthew uh, chapter 5 verse 28 where the teaching uh, of Jesus says, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her in his heart. And many people don't understand the word lust. It's, it's to totally lose control of your, your faculties is what the word lust means. So uh, I, to me, to think about something, you know, oftentimes people say, well, I had a dream and am I held accountable for what I dream? You know, you can't be held accountable for what you dream. That would not be fair because what you dream is, is in your subconscious. You know, it, you can't be held accountable for your subconscious, I don't believe. Don in Virginia. I'm having trouble with the purpose of having a pure bloodline from Adam to Jesus. Is it to show that God can accomplish such a feat with Satan physically and spiritually in the world and that by achieving Jesus' death and resurrection it proves that he will or can give eternal life to those who follow his ways? If this is incorrect, please straighten me out. It seems the, that Adamic people could easily be racist in their attitudes and actions if not properly educated in the Word of God. Additionally, is there any reason for a pure Adamic line to have continued to this day? Okay, let's take your first question. You see, God's plan was to bring a Messiah into the world, and, uh, that all nations, that means including Gentiles, would be blessed. And why? Because then they would have the chance at eternal life. So, and that was God's plan. Satan had an alternative plan. 
You see, he knew that God's plan would cause his demise, Satan's demise, because Messiah defeated death, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. That is to say, the devil. And, and Satan thought, if I could prevent Messiah from coming, that would save my skin, and therefore his plan was to send the fallen angels to earth to pollute the seed line through which Messiah was to come. Uh, God's reaction to that, the flood of Noah's time, which destroyed the descendants of the fallen angels. Uh, there was a second influx in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12, where they're called the Canaanites. Uh, and God's plan to counter that was the sword of Israel. Goliath, for example, was destroyed by the sword of Israel. You follow then, is it anything reason for a pure Adamic line to have continued to this day? No, not really. Uh, but the point again was polluting the seed line up to the point that Messiah was born. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 we learn that in Christ Jesus all are Abraham's seed. And you know we're often accused of, of being racist here at the chapel. Uh, I've been to several uh, local publishers uh, and talk to them when they have printed articles saying that we are racist because we say that God has a chosen people. That's not racist. That's what God's word says. You're calling God a racist if you say that. But uh, if you attended one of our uh, annual Passover meetings or a fall fellowship meeting, you'd probably be surprised about uh, concerning how many Afro-American people, how many Hispanics, how many people of all uh, races and creeds attend our meetings. Why? Because they know what we teach is truth. They don't consider what we teach to be racist. If, if what we teach is racist, you're calling God a racist. He's not a racist. He loves all of his children as it's written, I believe, the last verse of Genesis chapter 1. Mona in Texas, could you please explain why so many people are confused about what is preached in, preached in churches today, the rapture, because of uh, false teaching? And that's written. Uh, uh, Sister Babylon, uh, we know, is doing quite well. Babylon means confusion. Uh, the rapture theory is certainly confusion. Any, anything that, any time that man thinks that he can create his own salvation, it's going to fail. It's, it's, and it's false teaching. Uh, there is only one salvation. His name is Yeshua, and he is God's salvation. In fact, his name, Yeshua, means Yahweh's Savior. Shiner in Alabama. Where is it in the Bible, wrong is made right, and right is made wrong? Thank you, and God bless you and the staff, and you're welcome, and thanks for uh, remembering our staff, and God bless you as well. I think Isaiah uh, chapter 29, verse 16, gets that said. It's talking about the potter uh, talking to, excuse me, the clay talking to the potter and telling the potter, referring to God, you don't know what you're doing. And, and there in Isaiah 29, 16, it states, surely your turning things upside down shall be as esteemed as the potter's clay. And again, turning things upside down is reversing what they are. And that can be taken as making what's right wrong or what's wrong and trying to make it right. And boy, do we see a lot of that today. Uh, people encouraged to be politically correct but in actually what they're doing is taking what's an abomination to our Heavenly Father and making it okay, making it right in the name of political correctness. I don't care what you call it, it's still an abomination to our Heavenly Father if it says in His Word that it is an abomination. Bert in Arkansas, Hebrews 2.14, Satan had the power of death Christ died and rose. Satan is death. All powers and glory belong to our Father. 
I do not comprehend how the devil ever had the power of death. Could you give me a better understanding of this? Again, the reason Jesus came to the earth in the flesh we find in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 and that was to defeat he who had the power of death. That is to say Satan. Uh, you see Satan has a power of death if he's able to convince you that you shouldn't worship God and that's his goal. He wants you to worship him and if you worship Satan and fail to worship your heavenly Father, you're liable to end up suffering a death that's called the second death. It's the death of the soul, a much worse death than the death of the flesh. But by defeating death, as it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54, uh, Jesus defeated Satan. And therefore, we can say, uh, death uh, where is thy sting, grave? Where is thy victory? It has none because uh, Jesus Christ resurrected. If you believe on him, you will resurrect as well. James in New York. I cannot find out where our souls or spirits are before we are placed into a body uh, in the flesh. Are we in heaven or does God create new souls whenever one is needed? And at what point in time are we placed into a human body? It says in Scripture that our lot in life is to be born once, and after that the judgment. So does that mean our soul does not get placed into a human body until the moment we are born? What about miscarriages and preterm abortions? Since they are not technically uh, born, can I assume that souls or spirits were never placed into those bodies? No, that would be incorrect. Let's first take your first question. Where are the souls or spirits before they're placed in the flesh body? Uh, you can read about that in Job chapter 1, verse 6, where the sons of God, which are the angels, you could think of them, uh, came before God, you know, and, and all souls were created by God at the same time. He doesn't just create a soul when he needs one to place it in a, a human body. When is the soul, the spirit placed in the human body? Uh, Luke chapter 1, we can easily document that it's at the time of conception. Uh, there, Gabriel, the angel, visited Mary and informed her she was with child and the Father was the Holy Spirit. And she, what did she do? She went to her cousin, Elizabeth, who was six months pregnant with John the Baptist. And when Mary, uh, with Christ in her womb, came into the presence of Elizabeth, John leapt in his mother's womb at the, the presence of the Spirit. And therefore we know that uh, at the time of conception, the soul is there. Those who are aborted or miscarried, there was a spirit and a soul there. Uh, God takes that spirit back and they have met their requirement of having been in the flesh. Brad in Wisconsin, some of the teachings claim diseases, poverty, plagues, etc. are an act of the Lord. Does that mean I'm suffering cancer due to a previous sin? No, not necessarily at all, Brad. Uh, you know, we have uh, people in general have polluted the earth. Uh, we, we've made a mess of our waters, uh, the air, we're, we're driving machines that belch poisons, uh, poisonous to our human bodies in the air. And what do we expect? You know, we, we bring it on ourselves. Uh, for the most part, we don't follow the health laws as we should. And God makes it very clear. If you want to be healthy, you eat my way. And if you want to eat unclean, so be it. You're going to suffer the consequences. And uh, you're in our prayer uh, to concerning the cancer, Brad, and we, we ask God that, uh, to help you find a, a cure. His word uh, can uh, deliver and heal, don't forget. Robert in Indiana, when you die and go to heaven, what 
are they doing there? Well, you can read Revelation uh, chapter 21 and 22 is about as much as we know from God's Word about what they are doing in the eternity. Uh, we do know from 21 that it's going to be wonderful because uh, God wipes the tears away from His children's eyes and there is no more pain, no more sorrow, uh, no more death. All these things have passed away. Satan's in the lake of fire. Connie in Texas, how did Joseph remain in the king line of David in Israel? I'm not sure what, I think you're thinking that Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, is how the king line Judah was passed on to Jesus. But you see, Joseph was Jesus' stepfather. He wasn't his biological father, if you will. The Holy Spirit, he was the only begotten son of God. So uh, Joseph's genealogy had absolutely nothing to do with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Although, having said that, uh, Joseph was a descendant of David. You can document that easily in Matthew chapter 1. Although he came through David's son Solomon, Jesus, on the other hand, uh, Mary's father, Heli, you have his genealogy in Luke chapter 3. And that descendant of David came through David's son, Nathan. And uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was half of the tribe of Levi because her cousin Elizabeth was a Levite. And then her father, Heli, was of Judah, Luke chapter 3. I'm out of time. I love you all a great deal because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. You know, it makes his day when he looks down and he sees you seeking knowledge of him in the letter he wrote to you, the Bible. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, beloved, and it's this. You stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day. I'm talking even on days when you've got trouble. You know why? It's because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.